Okay. Hello and welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to Solutions. Today, we're talking about the soul trait of calm. We'll explore practical ways to help our children take ownership of this beautiful inner development. So I always like to start off with our definitions, make sure we're all on the same track. So according to the dictionary, definition of calm is defined as tranquil, quiet, soothing, peaceful, freedom from mental agitation. Synonyms would be relaxed and easygoing. Doesn't that sound lovely? So of course, the opposite, as we look at balancing our soul traits and seeing where are we on the spectrum, uh, is nervous, easily agitated or alarmed, relating to or affecting the nerves. Synonyms would be anxious, tense, timid, shy, fearful, and frightened. So how do we take this language and kind of bring it down, boil it down for our children, for little children? Uh, there, there's a wide range, but I just came up with some, some word pictures, right? Such as warm and happy on the inside. That's calm. For a small child who doesn't understand, what does calm mean? Warm and happy on the inside. And nervous, we might describe as shaky and afraid on the inside. Of course, there are a lot of other words we could use, but those are some great ones to get started. So I'm sure you've been there. You sign up for a new class for your child. It sounds exciting. We've all talked about it with our little ones. You want to try an, a new class. Maybe it's karate or, or, or ballet or in a swimming class, any number of things that we can try. And our child gets there and suddenly doesn't want to let go, doesn't want to take the class. They have fear of a new place, anxiety about uh, maybe performance based on their age, fear of failure. I can't do this. I'm afraid, right? Or how about dropping off our, our kids at daycare? For those of us who are working and have our little ones in school, preschool, the early years of elementary school, um, saying goodbye, right? Even, even in our congregations and our fellowships, any time we have to drop off a child and say goodbye, see you later, that can create separation anxiety. That's a big one, very common. How about at bedtime. We do the snuggles, we read all the stories, we tuck our children in, make sure they're, they're ready and set and, and gotten that quality time. We go to leave the room and boom, fear of abandonment. Our children don't want us to leave the room. That's another common one that can leave us all up uh, the tears, the frustration, maybe, maybe there are a number of chores still waiting to be done. And the clock is ticking. We want to say goodnight and move on with the rest of our night. And yet our child is just feeling a lot of anxiety about that, that aban feeling abandoned at night, that's scared, scared of the dark, right? I remember driving my son to school now, this is going back 25 years ago. He was in private school. I'm driving him while on the highway in New Jersey, where everything is stressed out anyway and moving at a very fast pace. We're running late. I'm stressed because we're running late. I'm driving like a maniac, weaving in and out of traffic, probably going a little too fast. My son is in the passenger seat. I see his shoelaces are untied. And now I'm even more panicked because I know he needs to have a shoelace tied so that he can, we can get to school, he can get out of the car and run in. And now I'm trying to tie his shoelace. The point being, I looked at his face out of the blue and what I see on his face is fear. My body language, my tone of voice, my erratic behavior, was putting my son in a state of fear and anxiety, all because I didn't want to get to the school late. 
it was so unbalanced. It was so it was so off track with what was really important and what really um, in the grand scheme of things, what we want to teach our kids. And so as we talk about developing a state of calm, it's all about the big perspective, the soul trait, finding balance, and really making the right thing important. So let me ask you, how can we parent in such a way that we help our kids develop the soul trait of calm, the ability to get calm when nerves and anxiety threaten to take over? I want to go back to a quote I shared in our last meeting. This is very interesting. In Exodus 20, 20, Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. In other words, Moses was saying, be calm. God has come to test you. Calm and healthy fear of sinning can coexist. I found this to be a beautiful point to highlight as we talk about the soul trait of calm. There is a place for our anxiety, resistance, and it's to avoid sinning, doing wrong, doing something that brings about death in the long run, right? That's what sin is. But then there's the calm of remembering these are just a test. It's all for our good. So I want to share with you um, a visual of the what ifs. What ifs tend to get us in a lot of trouble. So I'm going to share with you a flow chart I created to help us. Hopefully everyone can see. Can you see this flow chart? I'm going to bring it up on my screen. Okay. So here we have a visual map of our processes that that it helps guide our actions, identify roadblocks, and leads to more calm in challenging times as we explore what's happening in our, in our, in our thinking process. So we face a situation, and here we've got the what if, right? So that brings us to a choice. If we choose man's will right at the bottom, well, we find ourselves with anxiety due to our circumstances, which ultimately leads to, I can't, more what ifs, more anxiety, more negative scenarios because our brains are wired for protection. And so it's very, very natural for us to think of the negatives to be prepared, right? It, it all makes sense. But God is giving us another option, right? We can look at God's will, who's ultimately a benevolent, loving father. That leads to feelings of calm in spite of our circumstances. So we can have anxiety due to our circumstances, or we can have calm in spite of our circumstances. Now, let me explain this picture uh, along the flow chart line of God's will right? So we've got the what if, we're faced with a choice, we choose to embrace the fact, the truth, that God's will is at work, that allows us to have feelings of calm in spite of our circumstances, keeping in mind that we often see a door A and a door B. It can go one way or the other way, but God is the God of door C. He makes a way where there is no way. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. All of these sorts, kinds of verses are there to help us remember we're not seeing the whole picture. There's more that meets the eye and we can have in calm, calm in spite of our circumstances. So ultimately, let's keep in mind, feelings don't change our circumstances but we can change our feelings about our circumstances based on where we go with our what if. Okay, I'm going to stop that share. I just want to take a minute to digest this reality. Circumstances don't change. 
It's our feelings about the circumstances that we absolutely can pivot from man's will to God's will. All right. So now I would like to share with you going as I often do to our video vault. I want to share with you a little clip to get the conversation rolling on practical tips to help our children stay calm or or reclaim their calm, grab the tools of calm, and our inner child as well. Okay, give me one moment. Okay. <laughs> Give me one moment here to get that out of the way. All right. So in that short little video clip, we were looking at four different reasons why on a very practical level, a child might lose their calm, feel anxious and nervous. Let's break that down. The first possible reason, and there are many, are the rel relational triggers that hijack our calm. Those are the triggers of communication. So we've all witnessed it, right? Mom and dad don't agree on how Tommy should be corrected for being disrespectful. They begin to have conflict in communication that can turn into an argument, and they model what they know. Resentment, frustration, and a lack of trust starts to creep in when these conversations start to happen over and over again. The family is suffering. And so that, so that it moves to the point where even when things are quiet and nobody and, and everyone seems to be like quiet, there's no arguing, still nobody is calm right? Because it's been repetitive, that, that uh, heavy weight in the air, right? So the problem is, the problem is everyone is in fight, flight, or freeze, feeling threatened. There's a lack of conflict resolution or communication skills. The truth of the matter is people hurt people, right? So the natural response is protective mode due to the threat. Pro the problem solving portion of the brain is shut down. It's not activated. We're operating in purely an emotional state of instinct. So the solution, let's tag the problem. Let's tag it. I'm going to show you what I mean. Three steps that we can all remember when we find ourselves in a situation where we're struggling in a, in a situation to be calm. So when I say tag it, what I mean is the what. What is happening? Well, in, in this communication um, example, there's no communication tools or, or ineffective communication tools. Different perspectives, different experiences, and different modeling from our own childhood. Second part of tagging is why is this happening? Well, 
in this communication issue, there's a lack of information, lack of awareness, lack of know-how. We could go on and on about why this communication breakdown has happened. The last part of tagging is the how. How do I fix it? Well, we, we take one action step. Maybe that action step is to get a book on communication and connection. Maybe it's to seek professional help. Maybe it's, it's a, a combination or, or simply praying, getting on our knees and praying for God's wisdom. Maybe it's finding community others who are dealing with the same things and just getting various perspectives. Maybe we want to do all of the above, but that's the how, that's tagging the problem. There's a great quote that says, nothing changes if nothing changes, right? So one simple action step when it comes to the trigger of communication. Now let's talk about the second example which was the emotional triggers that hijack our calm due to a lack of sleep. Very practical, very relatable for all of us in the trenches of motherhood. Okay, so we're trying to do all the things. Kids are right behind us, undoing all of our work. It's like trying to string beads on a rope with no knot on the end. It just sort of feels like we're not really getting anywhere, right? So the house is a mess, dinner is late, there's more bills than dollars, you know, and bedtime can easily become a battle. We're talking about wear and tear, uh, exhaustion and frustration. And then if bedtime doesn't go well, this is clearly going to uh, be create a domino effect because now the next day doesn't go well. Something's got to give. It's easy to lose sleep at night due to the worries of all the things we deal with in the day. And kids who aren't sleeping only compile that, that frustration, that anxiety, that stress. And then when kids through this night after night bad habits form, and then there's no peace and calm, that just sort of goes to the back burner. A lack of sleep means no ability to endure, tolerate, resist impulses or sustain efforts successfully. We're running on stress. It's like having no gas in the tank. So what's the solution? Let's tag the problem. What, what is happening? High stimulation all day has the body set to an anxious state, an anxious default. Um, now let's look at why. Well, Obviously, this high stimulation is, is coming in through the gates of the eyes, the ears, right? All, all of our, uh, the influence that affects the five senses, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, right? It creates a mindset and then the bedtime habits need to be tweaked. So how? How do we fix this? Well, we take one action step. Create a nighttime vibe that begins hours before bedtime. Not, not even at bedtime, but hours before bedtime. I created a, a video class, a 30 minute video class called Best Practices for Bedtime Battles that covers all the little pieces leading up to bedtime and then all those little pieces involved in bedtime. And so working on being conscientious and intentional about Setting the family up for success at bedtime is a great way to set tomorrow up for calm. The quote that came to mind when I think about this is Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Right? We are being called to rest, to calm. And so now let's look at our third trigger. The social triggers that hijack our calm is a busy schedule and high demands. I'm sure we've all been there. We're driving in rush hour traffic. The kids are screaming. The phone is beeping. We're running late for dinner and the babysitter just canceled. Common scene. I know. I'm sure we've all been there. 
all of a sudden it hits us i can't do this i can't do this right but it's okay we all have those moments when we feel like giving up like we're just not enough and our calm vanishes into thin air the problem is tight schedules cramming too many things into the the day too many good things into the day and sacrificing quality of life in the process it's hard to say no to something good but only when we can keep uh the big picture of what is best are we do we have the self-control sometimes to say no to something good because we realize we have to protect quality of life we don't have to say yes to everything so the pressure to do what happens when we say yes to all the good things is that the pressure to do mounts against the pressure of what if i don't do right what do i have to do and what happens if i don't do and it creates it, it creates a, a pressure that compounds leaving us with this toxic feelings of disapproval, fear, and more what ifs, right? So we're gonna tag the problem. The what, what's happening is saying yes to the many good things that is choking off the soul trait of calm kids and a calm mom. Uh, why, right? Why is this happening? All the options are good. There are many needs and many desires and many opportunities, and it's, there's just not enough time in the day. The responsibilities associated with commitments create anxiety and stress. And that's the thing we tend to struggle with, is we look at the, the good thing and all the, the benefits that come from it and sort of forget all the responsibilities involved and the what ifs if we don't measure up to those responsibilities. And that, that can easily sabotage quality of life and steal our calm. So third tag, how do we fix it? Take one action step. Add margin to the schedule. Be realistic about expectations on self and others. Uh, so let me explain what I mean when I say margin. We need margin to protect our peace and calm. It's that buffer, that little bit of wiggle room at the front end and at the tail end of every activity. When we bumper one commitment right on the heels of another, there's no room for real life to happen. And that creates an uh, unrealistic expectation on ourselves and everyone else. And there is no way we're going to be calm in those situations. I love this quote I found, and I don't know who the author is, but uh, maybe if somebody comes across it, you can share it in the replay or in, in, in later videos. But it says, I did things I did not understand for reasons I could not begin to explain, just to be in motion, to be trying to do something, change something in the world I wanted desperately to make over. Ah, oh, that just was powerful, powerful. We want to make a change, don't we? We want to stay engaged and useful and purposeful, creating good things in the world. But sometimes in that great effort, we lose sight of our margin, of our quality of life, of our need to be realistic and protect our calm. All right, the last trigger we're gonna look at is the physical triggers that hijack our calm, specifically our diet, because food makes mood. Who hasn't been invited to a birthday party with the kids only to watch a child running wild through the crowd, 
sneaking cookies and soda off the table and then having a massive meltdown when it's time to go home. I think you can go to any public facility and, <laughs> and see this scenario playing out. You just know what's coming. Are the kids having fun? Well, of course they are. And we want our kids to have childhood fun. But is mom anxious and nervous in this whole process? Yes. And of course, the children will be later as well. The problem is that little bodies can only handle so much sugar, dyes, processed food. Um, you know, we know this. This is, uh, this is common knowledge now. It begins to show signs physically and emotionally that our bodies are getting toxic. So sugar has a wide range of effects on the body. Consuming much sugar leads to a range of physical, behavioral, and emotional changes, such as hyperactivity, irritability, difficulty concentrating, and impulsive behavior. Nothing new here. This is high on our radar in this community. Uh, but the emotional changes include mood swings, extreme irritability, and emotional outbursts. There's just no calm anywhere in that dynamic. So let's tag the problem. The what? What is happening? Food sensitivities to sugar, dyes, processed food, and even the time of day can trigger anxiety or nerves and hinder the soul trait of calm. Why? Why is it happening? Are we too busy to make healthier choices? Is it just convenient? Uh, is it economical? Is it just simply enjoyable? Right? These are the reasons why we make these choices even though we know better. <clears throat> so then finally, how do we fix it? Right? We take one simple action step. We can pre prep fresh foods in advance. We can place those things in convenient places, such as the car, such as on the counter. Where do we hang out? Where do we spend our time? The children will easily grab whatever's near to them, even mindlessly, right? We, we all do mindless eating by the TV, um, wherever while doing homework, but these are strategic places to put healthy food choices for our children so that they don't become starving and look for things that are simple, easy, quick, convenient, sweet, right? And if we're preoccupied, we're going to say yes when maybe we should say no. So these are some small ways to uh, address the, the diet. The quote I love here is, Eat good food to avoid meds, medication, or one day medication will be your food. Powerful, right? Food is medicine. So before we conclude, let's look at the resistant child. What do we do for the child who just refuses to uh, acclimate to our efforts, refu re refuses what we're trying to do to create the soul trait of calm in ourselves, in our home vibe, in our children. So let's look at communication. We're looking to connect in the emotion and redirect it. So if our child is feeling anxious, this is where we say, hey, that bad feeling inside right? That shaky, fearful feeling inside. I have felt that too. And share a story or I get it. I feel like that when I, and give an example of some of the things we know trigger our anxiety or our discomfort internally, right? And then redirect. This is what I do when I'm feeling that way. Do you want to try that? Or what do you think would help you feel better? Oftentimes our children have the answer. They just, need it. they just need to be prompted to share. So connecting before we redi redirect. Okay, the other thing is sleep. For the resistant child, predictable routines, knowing what to expect night after night, even if it's a struggle for a while, 
the brain acclimates to whatever is predictable, whatever is a predictable pattern. So that is in a, a great way to just basically just stay at it. Be intentional, stay at it. Children will test, but they will they will fall into the pattern over time. And then high demand schedules. Remember to bring in that margin, that bumper, that little extra at the front end and the tail end of commitments. And then diet, healthy snacks in convenient places. Even the resistant child can't help mindlessly grabbing whatever's nearby. <laughs> Finding balance comes with maturity, and ultimately, it is their timing for our resistant kids. We teach by example, by being patient, and by lots of prayer. So join us next time as we explore the soul trait of obedience. Thank you. <laughs>